And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Guys, you know I love Summoner Wars. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. And when they came out with the master set, that was amazing. Then I heard they were making a second master set, and they were mixing factions, having dual factions, and my mind went, it was so exciting. And finally, I've, been, I've heard about this over a year ago, finally it's out, or it's coming out soon, but I got my copy. Summoner Wars Alliances Master Set. This is a box that not only has eight factions in, which is more than the first master set, only had six, each of these factions is a dual faction. There's 16 current factions. They took each of these factions and mixed them together to make a dual faction deck. And I'll explain a little bit how that works in a moment. Uh, to, to put this together. And then this game also comes with dividers and room to put all the rest of the cards that have been made to this point. And new boards. Oh, it's great, folks. I'm giving my opinion at the beginning, but I don't care. Here we go. Okay, first we're gonna look at the box. Summoner Wars, Alliances, uh, with all the different guys all around the outside of it, really cool box cover. But you'll notice this box is a longer box and that's because inside it holds all the cards. This is everything that has been released for the game in sleeves. And there's still room, even with sleeves, that you could, I'm hoping, I don't know, it's gonna be tight, with the second summoners for the last six or eight factions, I don't know if they'll be able to fit in very easily. But if you're not using sleeves, then no problem at all. And the boards that come with this will fit into one of these slots. Now, each of these, there comes with all these dividers for the game. Each divider tells you what's in that faction. So this is the summoner of the cave gobs and tells you where you get that faction in case you don't have it already. The amount of cards that come in this game are about right over here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, eight factions here. And so these are the eight dual factions that come with the game. Everything else is stuff I've already had. So if you're buying just this, you definitely have plenty of room to keep this in the box. Speaking of the board, here it is. This is um, a map. It shows you of a world that looks suspiciously like um, the, the actual world. but. I don't know how much I like this. The board I like. These boards that roll up, these mouse pad style boards, fantastic. Love them. It lays flat. It's better than their cardboard board and definitely better than their paper boards. It just feels weird to be playing a tactical game of some guys fighting in combat on a world map. But eh, it doesn't bother me that much. I'm here basically just to use the grid anyway. The game also comes with um, some tokens. These are boost tokens used for one of the factions. These are poison and health tokens, and I don't have mine punched out yet because I use custom tokens for each of those, and then it also comes with some dice. Not terrible dice, but uh, I also use my own dice. Okay, first we're gonna talk a little bit about deck building. Here we have Hogar, who's the summoner of the Tundra Guild. So every unit in his army is called the Tundra Guild. Well, that means I can take units from the Tundra Orcs and put them in his army, and I can also take units from the Guild Dwarves and put them in his armies. Not to mention, I'm always allowed, of course, to put mercenaries in his armies also. Now, if I use Torgan, who is the summoner of the Tundra Orcs, I can use units from the Tundra Orcs. I can't use Guild Dwarves, but I can use these Tundra Orc Guild, and they can go into his. So, the guys who are dual summoners have the most versatility uh, about putting people in because he can take Tundra um, Guild and Tundra Guild, while the Tundra Orcs can take Tundra Guild stuff and Tundra Orcs, or a Guild Dwarf, like for example, Olden here, he can take his Guild stuff and he can take stuff from the Tundra Guild. So what this does is it really blows the deck building of this game wide open because you can really move around a lot of units. Although there's still a lot of units in the game that really make sense in one summoner's army. I'd like to make it clear right now that I like every faction in this, this box. However, um, I'm going to show them to you from my least favorite to my most favorite. I'm going to quickly do a, a brief overview since there is eight factions. This is surprising me that this is my least favorite because the jungle elves are my favorite faction. But, well, we'll get to that. But the, this guy here basically can summon a cost next to a jungle shadow unit you control. And I should mention here 
that when you summon, it says a jungle shadow unit, that can also be a jungle unit or a shadow unit when you're using this guy. So he can summon a guy and place it adjacent. So this guy has some great maneuverability and he has people who have maneuverability. The child champion can be put back in your hands before it's killed and you can cast it again. It's expensive, but you can play it more than once. Uh, Satura, even though, like I said, this is my least favorite faction, this is one of my favorite champions. She just jumps over and over people doing damage to them as she's jumping across them. And Gargos here, who is affectionately, we you know, and as Batman at this point in time, uh, he has some really great maneuverability. And they all have maneuverability. There's a lot of jungle. They did a good job at mixing the factions together. They have the speed of the jungle, but they also have the movement in the shadows. Where this guy... Um, at any turn, you can put this back in your hand, and you can spend a magic point to replace it with another shadow unit. So you kill one shadow, ha, ah, there's another one there. The shaman, who has the chant of haste, and then just uh, units that you can control and move them over on the board. So this is another faction, if you like speed and kind of sneakiness involved, you'll like the jungle shadow. The sand cloaks have event abilities. Event abilities are things that can be stuck underneath a unit basically as an upgrade. The summoner, when she has one underneath her, she can use it to give it to anybody on the map. The different abilities here is a far shot. This, if this unit is a range symbol, it's, you can hit people who are four away. This one here, if you move someone, you can move an extra spot. This one here, when you're attacking a champion or summoner, you get one attack. This one here, when they attack an adjacent unit, they can attack two other units, Blitz. And these are really cool special abilities, and so she can give that out. There's also the Tinkerer, who doesn't have anything to do with event abilities, but he can basically cancel abilities from someone who's close to him. Pain in the neck. The Scholar, you can, if you have Scholars, they basically are worthless out there in the battlefield, but they let you take an event ability from a unit and put it in your hand, or you can spend a magic point to get event abilities from your discard pile. So if you draw some event abilities at the beginning, you can throw them in your discard pile or put them in your magic and spend them for uh, discard pile, and you'll know you'll get them later on. You can use scholars to pull them back out of your deck and give them to your hunters. You give one hunter an ability, all your hunters get it. Uh, this guy here, he can copy someone's ability that's near him. And Bauble here, you can discard an event ability from underneath them to ignore any wounds. So there's some really cool things they can do with these upgrades, these event abilities. The Cave Filth is the only faction in the game that actually feels like just one of the factions. This really feels like just the Filth, and that makes sense because they've subjugated the, the Cave Goblins. First of all, look at this guy. Nine hit points. That's impressive right there. Doesn't do a lot of attack, but whenever he... When, any, when someone on your side kills somebody, instead of putting them in your magic pile, you can put them into a prison pile, which is basically next to your magic pile. And you're also allowed to take a card of your prison pile and put it on your magic pile, so if you decide not to use it, but why would you want to use them? Well, there's different things you can do. First of all, there's this, this guy here, the Feed It Souls. This guy's another nasty, gigantic guy who has to kill someone every turn. Um, however, if you can't do that, you can get rid of the, the prison pile. Or he goes away, the Soul Eater. I guess he goes eat someone else. And Hester here, he's plus one for every two cards in your prison pile. So by himself, you know, he's worthless, he's a zero. But you get, you know, eight cards in your prison pile. Now this guy is attacking at four dice. Crazy, especially for how cheap he is. And Scabagus. <laughs> What a terrible name. Uh, this guy here, when he gets wounds, he can discard a card from your prison pile to ignore those wounds. You have prisoners that when you summon them, there's a 50% chance they're going directly to prison, not even showing up. Taskmasters, they can whip people, give them extra attack, especially prisoners. Man, I feel so bad for the cave goblins. And then the mutations. This is something that was introduced in the filth set where you have the ability to mutate common units and make them go higher. So this guy here... I can spend four magic units to put people from cards from the prison pile underneath this guy and they add one to his life points and to his attack value. Notice he starts at a very low cost, but he can get more powerful. The poison mutant, where you can do poison markers, attack someone else. The bone mutant, where you get you can um you can put a wound on him to give him a ranged three attack. The barbed mutant, the burrow mutant, the grotesque mutant, uh, living shield, where you can put wounds on them, basically uh, sacrificing cards from your prison pile to ignore wounds that are put on your people. 
or you can move and attack with your units. Here you can take three common units from your discard pile and put them in your prison pile, which is really fun when you're playing someone else. You're like, ah, your dwarves, they're going to prison. So anyway, that's the cave build. The Swamp Mercenaries come with a pile of Vine Walls. Incidentally, Swamp Mercenaries, while you can put Mercenaries in their deck and you can put them in a Mercenary deck, they are not Mercenaries that can go in anyone's deck. Uh, but this guy here is pretty powerful. When he destroys an enemy unit, he basically changes them into a Vine Wall. Now, Vine Walls only have two hit points. They're easy to destroy, but you get Vine Walls out there. You can be dropping enemy bad guys, I mean, or I'm sorry, you're the good guys, dropping them into your enemy. He can also kill two units of his own, common units, and turn them into Vine Walls. At the beginning of his turn, each unit that's next to a Vine Wall, enemy units can't move. And this one, if you play it at the right time, you can add to his attack value for each vine wall you control up to a maximum of five. He's already doing two damage and he's ranged at the right point, at the right time. If you have enough vine walls out, he can do seven damage. And he has other people who are affected by the vine walls. We have the swordsman who can move through other units and he doesn't have to move, he doesn't have to roll when he moves off a vine wall. Most units have to roll when they go off a vine wall and they could possibly take damage when they're jumping off them. Or Min the Tusk here, who he gets plus one for each vine wall that he's adjacent to. Or the little frog here who can destroy vine walls so that he doesn't take wounds. Yeah, isn't he cute? Okay, um, then we got just regular units, this big, bad, nasty common that you have, and Turt. I just like this guy's name. He's a lumbering guy, and he can only be hit on fives or higher. If you're gonna be opening this box for the first time, and you wanna pick a starter deck for someone to play, then you wanna pick the Vargoth Vanguard. I mean, these are, first of all, they're the good, good, good guys, um, but also they are one of the easiest people to play. You can pick someone within two spaces of them and they get plus one attack and you can move that person from the summoner. And then you have this crusader who's a pretty tough guy with three hit points as it is, but he adds one to the attack value of every unit that has the word light in their name, um, uh, in, sorry, in their ability name within two spaces. And I checked and there's a couple people in the current um, Vanguard who have the word light in them, but in this particular deck, there's this guy here, Father Benjamin, who is kind of like a, a savior of your summoner. You can bring him out later, and if he's killed, you can spend four magic points to take wounds off your summoner. So you can run him around the board willy-nilly. You're like, oh, kill him, I don't care, especially if your summoner is wounded. And you can also reveal it and put him on the bottom of the deck so that he shows up later on. Also, he has that return to light, so he's helped out by the Crusaders as are the cherubims, who are weeny people, but they can fly around. They go extra space, move through other people, and then they have a one range attack, but they're easy to kill. Then we have the change form, so you can give someone else ability name, so you can give other people that light ability if you want. Or here, um, you can uh, ignore wound markers and put one on your summoner. You have defenders who hold the line and they help get the defense of people who are around them. Here, you know, whenever someone takes a, well, we already showed that one. Here we have a champion, they form rank. You can place a common unit next to this guy, not to mention he's really tough as it is, rolls three dice, has six hit points. And then you have a lightning strike where you can do three or two wounds on a common or champion unit, or you can do four on a wall unit. And sometimes that lightning strike can be played at the right time, boom. Just take somebody out, especially the summoner, if they're like behind a wall or something. Now we have the Fallen Phoenix, where they can spend magic points to add to your die results. This can be pretty powerful, could be useful, could be okay. He's also a very weak summoner here, four hit points and he's killed, although he has a great three range attack. But he has some cool stuff. First of all, he has these har harbingers. These guys walk around and when they kill a unit, you roll. And if you roll a four or higher, you can bring out a conjuration from your conjuration pile. Depending on which summoner you're using, if you're using this guy, they are burning skeletons, magical burns. And when you kill these skeletons, there's a chance they don't go to your magic pile. So then you bring out a guy with two attack. It's great to turn your enemies into your friends. You have this warrior here, and he can move around really quickly. After you attack, you can roll a die in a four or higher. He can go next to any other unit you control, so he can jump around. Um, the cultists here, they when they you attack somebody with a cultist, if you roll a six, you put two wound markers on the cultist, and each wound he takes, or up, up to two markers, you can wound your opponent. 
That's crazy. These guys are crazy. They'll take wounds to hurt your opponent. I love them. Then one of the most powerful characters in the game again, the Hellfire Drake with nine hit points, a three attack, and he doesn't even have to attack. He can just do one wound in every unit that he's next to. Yeah, usually I want to use a three attack, but sometimes that can come in handy, especially when you're fighting an army with a lot of weak units. Or this guy, who's also powerful, the leader of the cult. And when you attack with a cult next to him, they get plus one. And you can put a wound marker to put a cultist next to her. She leads the cultists around. Here, when one of your units destroys someone, you can bring one of your common folks, summon it, and put it in that space. You are basically a necromancer in this one. Uh, a dwarf, I mean an elf necromancer, which is kind of creepy. Here, uh, you can destroy a cultist. Take control of an enemy common unit that's next to that cultist until the end of this turn. And they get precise, which means they will hit automatically with the number of dice that they, that they normally would roll. Here you can kill one of your own guys, basically blow him up to hurt people around him. And then this guy here, when you attack with him, you can, um, you can, let's see here, you can choose a common fallen kingdom unit from an opponent's discard pile, pay the summon cost and put it next to him. So another guy who brings people back from the dead. Oh, this is so annoying to your opponents. I really like running this army because you kill my guys, but they get up again. You can never keep them down. Endric here, the summoner of the Deep Benders, has a bunch of boost tokens that he'll be using in his deck. And he can choose a boosted unit and spend a magic to attack with that unit. But what that means are, you have many common units in this, well actually every common unit in this deck has a boost cost. This one costs one to put out, but a boost cost allows you to I could pay two more to add two to her life, and she can spend magic points to cure wounds from people that she moves to. The Geopath here costs one, but if I pay an extra one, he gets an extra attack and he can hit people five spaces away. The Deep Dragon only costs one, but if you boost it for two more, it now has a life of three, and when you move it, you can move it an extra space for some nasty attack power. You can even choose two people who aren't boosted with this and just automatically boost them for free. You can take a boosted person and exchange places with your summoner. You can remove boost tokens to take cards from your discard pile and put them back in your magic pile. You can spend a magic point here. This has nothing to do with boosting. This is one where you can just simply summon a conjuration, a gorgon, who first of all has a death stare, which can kill common units. And secondly, basically you just pay an event card to put out a guy for free. That's awesome or a uh, gal for free. Here we have, uh, after you move with this person, you can choose a boosted unit within three spaces. We remove the boost and you put it somewhere else, which is kind of cool. They also have a three range attack, which is great, but she is weak as all get out. Then the Al Griffin, making Harry Potter scared as all get out. Instead of attack, this guy's a powerful attacker, but if you don't attack with him and you don't attack with your summoner, you can take a card from your discard pile, put it on your magic pile. Oh, it's so much fun. One of my favorite abilities in the game. It is neat. Uh, the boosting mechanisms easily elevates this to my second favorite army from this set. And now for my favorite deck. I'm not sure why the dwarves and the orcs are working together. Maybe the dwarves have enslaved the orcs, who knows, but whoa. First of all, um, this guy here, walls you control only get wound markers on a four or higher. That's not that powerful a special ability, right? Who cares if your walls don't get, most people don't even go for walls. That's because he, he, these guys can have ice walls, but he doesn't actually come with ice walls. Well, instead, he comes with runes of power. The runes of power you can put underneath people and they give that person a permanent special ability. Like for example here, the rune of power. When if you roll a five or higher, it counts as two hits. That's so awesome. Here you have the rune of heroism where you can increase the unit's attack by one. Here, you have the rune of shackling, where you can choose a, a unit there, and they basically can't do anything. They, they can spend points to get rid of these runes, but you hurt your opponent. Here, you have the rune of nullification, get rid of their special ability. Here, you have a master rune, where you can go through your deck and find the runes, but this is even better. These ice golems, which are kind of slow, cool guys, but if these have a card underneath it, then it becomes an ice wall, which means it's a moving wall that's walking around and you're summoning guys next to it. And this guy removes two wound markers from every ice wall on the battlefield. You have a bunch of these guys out there with events underneath them. Suddenly they're walking walls that you're removing things from. And this guy here, 
when you, after you attack with him, you can flip the top card, and if it happens to be, have the quote-unquote built special ability, which these guys do, it comes out, so you can be bringing these guys out on the board. Then you have other people here. If there's an event card under a common unit, you can draw a card for each scribe you control. Here, this guy, if he has an event card underneath him, a rune card underneath him, he turns into a bow. For a common, it's pretty cool. He starts out with two attack. A two bow is not a bad thing for a guy with two health. And this champion guy here, you can reveal the top card. If it's a rune, you add one to his attack value of that attack. Then you put the rune card in the top of your draw pile. That's so awesome. I love this. I love the runes in this deck, and I love the walking ice walls. And I love guys like this. He's just a cool picture where this guy runs around. When you attack with a common unit that's next to him, they're plus one on each of your die rolls. So you give the guy plus one to your moving ice wall. That's going to get double hits if he rolls a five or higher. <laughs> I feel like I didn't do justice there to all the different factions, but hopefully through that you saw what some things about different factions. I didn't show every card, didn't talk about every strategy, but I played with all the factions. I played with them all multiple times. I played this game a lot so far, and I really like it. Actually, I think my win margin is up. I don't often win Summoner Wars, but I've won with these things. Now, I have to wonder, like you probably are, are these dual summoners power creep? Are they better than the other summoners? That I can't tell you. Come back in a year when I do some more deck building. I played a couple of the dual summoners against the single summoners and they seem fine. But with the fact that you can take cards from other factions that the dual summoners come from and put them in, gives them a wider range of units. So does that make them better? Well, there's two things that, I'm, that don't make me worry about that. One is I know that Plat Hat has one of the best playtesting teams on the planet. They playtest till their the fingers are bleeding. They really playtest their games. Secondly, most of these decks, I wasn't even thinking about what could I add. I'm thinking maybe I'd take some of these cards and stick them in other decks, but most of these decks are good, solid decks on their own. So there might be a time where like, oh, I'll trade out a couple of these common units, throw in some mercenaries or throw in some tundra orcs or whatever. But for the most part, I'm very satisfied with these. And even though I just gave you the decks from my lowest to greatest, it doesn't matter. I love them all. They're all fun. And I've had such a blast. And ha oh, ha, oh, tundra orcs are now, man, the tundra guild... Oh, I love those guys. That's, oh man, they're, they're rivaling the jungle elves for my favorite faction. But anyhow, this is a great value. Should you get it if you're just getting into Summoner Wars? You can. I'd recommend going out and buying one of the two-player starter sets first to see how you like Summoner Wars. But this is a great value. You're getting a lot. The Summoner Wars, the, the cycle's almost complete. There's only eight more second summoners for eight of the factions. But even if they stopped here and the company went out of business... This is so much. This is a fantastic game. It's in my top 10. This makes it even better. Wow! Dice Tower Judgment, so awesome. I just, ah, uh, ah, uh, it's wonderful. It's amazing. Buy it now. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. Mach die Tür zu! Boom. Boom.